Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. As you probably know already, we produce a number of other podcasts here at the History Network. Angus has his own dedicated to World War II podcast at www2podcast.com. Well worth a listen. Some of his recent episodes include The Race for the Rhine, Airborne at Operation Husky, and Volunteers and Pressed Men. We produced a podcast for Ancient Warfare magazine and War Games Soldiers and Strategy. And if that wasn't enough to keep you occupied, we'd just begun producing the podcast for Medieval Warfare magazine. So if all things military and medieval is your thing, the first couple of podcasts are already out. The easiest way to find all of this info is to go to the website, the History Network. Dot org and hover your cursor over the podcasts menu in the top left of the home page and you can select anything you wish from there by the way we also sell our own podcast past seasons here at the history network via the website just go to the store link there there are plenty of seasons to choose from each one running from between three and five hours depending on which one it is and we sell these as nice chaptered files for download at just two pounds each the history network.org podcast season 22 episode 6 bloody antietam this episode was written by Sam de Turberville. Sam is a 22-year-old from Ireland with a BA in marketing. His true passion lies in history and ranges from the Phoenicians to the Normans and the War of Austrian Succession to the American Civil War. He does, however, have a particular interest in Irish regiments in foreign armies, and he hopes to write more podcasts for us in the future. Why was the Battle of Antietam so bloody? The 17th of September 1862 saw the single bloodiest day in American history. Why? The Battle of Antietam Creek, as it was known to the Union, or the Battle of Sharpsburg, as it was known to the Confederate States, was fought on the 17th of September 1862 and became the most costly one-day battle of the American Civil War. The battle claimed nearly 23,000 casualties, including six generals, and in a protracted four-year civil war it would go on to cost over 600,000 lives. While the official death toll for the battle stands at nearly 4,000, in actual fact, the true death toll is closer to 9,000, as many men who were marked down as wounded on the field of battle would later die in hospitals, some even months after the battle. The battle was a contest between the infamous Southern General Robert E. Lee and the overly trepidatious but highly organised commander of the Northern Forces, General George B. McClellan. McClellan had previously been given the command of the Union forces on the Eastern Theatre of the Civil War and forged the Army of the Potomac. This army had been drilled and formed into a highly organised and motivated force of around 175,000 by mid-1861. The famously cautious McClellan requested the ranks be bolstered to 250,000 to take the fight to the Confederates and the end of the war in one swift campaign. After a string of blunders and southern victories, McClellan was relieved of command and replaced but Lincoln eventually and reluctantly reinstated McClellan's command of the Army of the Potomac in June 1862. Robert E. Lee's plan was to take the fight to the Union and off of the beleaguered and depleted southern farms and homesteads. Lee, who was originally offered the command of all Union forces on the Eastern Front at the outset of the war, declined, electing to fight for his home state of Virginia. This action was commonplace among professional soldiers. Many men who would have been proud supporters of the Union chose to fight for their home states against the Union. 
Lee knew that many in Maryland had sympathies towards the southern cause of secession, as did a large number of Union citizens who lived in other border states. Baltimore was the only Union town which required a constant garrison throughout the war in order to suppress southern sympathies from becoming militant. Lee had amassed his invasion force of 40,000 to take the fight to the Union. This army of northern Virginia, although a large force, was outnumbered nearly two to one by McClellan's 84-odd thousand men. Lee divided his force into three attacking columns and passed into Maryland, largely undetected, taking the Union supply depot at Harper's Ferry. It was only when a Union soldier came across Lee's battle plans that they were alerted to mass troop movements right in their own backyard. Lee had managed to completely outmaneuver McClellan's force and found themselves north of the Union army near a town called Sharpsburg by the Antietam Creek. The battle is known for its casualty hotspots, areas on the battlefield where the fighting was significantly heavier than in other areas. Factors such as the rolling terrain of the Maryland countryside the advancements in weapons technology versus outdated military doctrine, and the incompetency of those in charge of the forces, all contributed to the shocking violence of the battle, making the 17th of September the bloodiest day in US history. These hot spots included the Miller's Cornfield, the West Woods, and the sunken, soon to be aptly named Bloody, Lane. The battle opened at 5.30 a.m. on the Confederate left, which was the western side of the battlefield, as the Union First Corps under General Hooker made its advance. The aim was to hit Lee's western flank, then his east, to completely stretch his forces and finally to smash the Confederate centre. The objective of Hooker's attack would be to take the Dunker Church on Lee's western flank, as Hooker's first corps of about 8,600 men advanced, they came under heavy artillery fire from the extreme Confederate west on the Nicodemus Heights. The famed Iron Brigade were hammered by the well-positioned Confederate cannon. Hooker ordered his guns to respond to Confederate Major Pelham's with counter-battery fire. The ensuing match between the guns was dubbed Artillery Hell by those who experienced it. The Union Army had more advanced rifled Parrot cannon to combat the smoothbore Napoleonic-era Confederate cannon. It was said that the Confederate cannon could hit a barn at a thousand yards, whereas the Union cannon could hit the barn door. The Confederates had no reply to the unrelenting Union fire. The Union First Corps began taking fire from the Miller's Cornfield, where the famed Confederate General Thomas Stonewall Jackson's 7,700 men were waiting in a solid defensive position. Miller's Cornfield was on the west of the battlefield and would become 24 acres of hell for those who marched into it. In just five hours of fighting, there would be an unprecedented 12,000 casualties. This created a casualty rate of roughly one per second. Because of a severe drought, the cornfield, that would soon see unfathomable casualty rates, was not tall enough to hide entire companies of men, so contrary to previous thought, the Confederates could not hide in the corn. Instead, they prepared a barricade just outside of the cornfield, and waited for the Union soldiers to advance, drawn up in a line of battle. The reason for these lines was because, on the battlefields of the 1700s, when these tactics were developed, the musket was most effective in a wall of lead fired at once. The order was present and fire, the idea being that the soldiers would present a wall of lead. The word aim was carefully omitted from the orders, as to do so would be an exercise in futility. The Confederates opened fire at 70 yards with a devastating and shattering volley. It completely routed the Union Brigade that received it. The battle in the cornfield ebbed and flowed several times throughout the course of the morning. The Confederates would beat the Union back, only to have their advance halted and counterattacked by the rallied northern soldiers. 
This brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat and devastating musket fire created an unprecedented 8,000 casualties before 9am. The fighting was so intense that even the wounded fought each other on the blood-soaked ground on the cornfield. Confederate Lieutenant Colonel Pendleton said of the cornfield, Such a storm of balls I never conceived it possible for men to live through. Shot and shell, shrieking and crashing, canister and bullets, whistling and hissing, most fiend-like through the air until you could almost see them. Reinforcements were sent in piecemeal, so the volume of soldiers actively engaged in the cornfield didn't vary much, just the men who fought. This trepidatious commanding by McClellan effectively eliminated his numerical superiority, as Lee had built a network of roads behind his lines. He did this so he could quickly move troops who weren't in combat areas to those that needed reinforcement. Lee did this safe in the knowledge that McClellan would not commit a large force to a full frontal attack. Union Lieutenant Matthew J. Graham of the 9th New York Volunteers was lying on my back, supported on my elbows, watching the shells explode overhead and speculating as to how long I could hold up my finger before it would be shot off, for the very air seemed full of bullets when the order to get up was given. I turned over quickly to look at Colonel Gimble, who had given the order, thinking he had become suddenly insane. The fire was so heavy that the cornfield appeared to be cut by a scythe by the hail of bullets. One soldier described what he saw in the cornfield as systematic killing. The Confederates sent in General Hood's infamous Texans to take the cornfield. The fighting was so fierce that the men of the 1st Texas Infantry lost 82% of their men, which was the highest rate for any Confederate regiment in one battle. With Hooker's forces being depleted from the unrelenting action, General Mansfield's 12th Corps was sent in as reinforcements. Numbering 12,000 men, the 12th Corps consisted of three divisions. The Union men managed to bring up a battery of cannon and unlimbered them right into the cornfield. They opened fire point-blank at the Louisiana Tigers, holding their position in the cornfield, and completely slaughtered them. The fire from Battery B was so relentless that the Louisiana Tigers lost 323 of their 500 men. At 9am, Sumner's 2nd Corps was deployed to the West Woods. Sumner had three divisions under his command, but only sent in one under the command of General Sedgwick. This cautious commanding prolonged the conflict and made it possible for the cornfield to become the casualty hotspot that it was. As the Union troops emerged from the other side of the West Woods, they came under canister fire from Major Pelham's cannon battery on the Nicodemus Heights. Canister shot was in effect a giant shotgun that could obliterate dozens of men with a single shot. This effectively halted the Union advance through the West Woods. As the Confederate brigades of Early, McClaws and Walker counter-attacked, they managed to envelop the Union men on three sides. This created confusion amongst the Union soldiers and the casualty count grew even higher. Mansfield had been mortally wounded moments after marching onto the front line and without a corps commander the momentum the Union had in the cornfield halted. Because the flintlock hammer had been made redundant and was replaced by a cap with a small charge in it, there was no need to prime, pour gunpowder into the pan so reloading times were drastically shortened. This made a much higher rate of fire possible. Due to the short reloading times of these modern rifles, coupled with the fact that black powder produces copious amounts of smoke, Sedgwick's men had no idea where they were. The Union soldiers were being massacred as the bullets whizzed overhead and found their targets. In the confusion, the men of General Sedgwick's division began to open fire on their own men not knowing where they were because of the deafening noise and blinding smoke. Within half an hour, the Union division lost 2,200 of its 5,500 men 
and were totally routed. Hooker had also been wounded and carried off the field, so any comprehensive attack plan stagnated as the initiative was lost by the Union. Lee's left flank had been badly bruised, but it had ultimately held. The bloody battle for the cornfield and the west woods, which had cost thousands of casualties, would peter out as the attention shifted to the centre of the battlefield and the defensive position at the sunken lane. Nowhere was the terrain a bigger factor than at the centre of the battlefield. A gentle slope, a dip after the crest and another rise before an old wagon trail. This scene of serenity would be one of the bloodiest of the day, taking 2,500 Confederate casualties and 3,000 Union casualties. The Irish Brigade, consisting of the 69th New York Volunteers, 63rd and 88th New York, and the 29th Massachusetts, would find themselves thrust into the middle of a bloody conflict over the course of the next few hours. They were led by General Francis Marr, and at 9.30am they made their advance towards the sunken lane. They immediately came under fire from the Confederate cannon as they opened fire with solid shot. Solid shot acted like a giant musket ball capable of killing half a dozen soldiers with a single shot. The effects were devastating. Mars' men advanced in a steady line as armies had for the last 200 years, but 200 years in firearms innovation produced weapons that were far more advanced than the tactics used at the time. The generals still employed tactics that were best used in battles where both sides fielded inaccurate muskets. The muskets of the 1700s were only effective up to 70 yards, but the weapons of the 1860s were effective up to 120 yards. Confederate skirmishers using more accurate rifled muskets started picking off members of the 69th New York Volunteers and the 29th Massachusetts. They were well in advance of the sunken lane, where the Confederates had set up a defensive position. This advancement is part in thanks to a revolutionary advance in projectile technology. A Frenchman named Minet created a grooved, elongated projectile that was more accurate and deadly than a smooth musket ball. The musket ball moved so slowly that it would embed itself in bone, whereas the Minet ball could travel through three bodies carrying debris, infection, blood and bacteria through its victims, and if it hit a bone it would completely shatter along its entire length. This mine ball was responsible for tens of thousands of deaths and many more amputations, as the only thing a surgeon could do with a shattered bone would be to amputate it. The men of the Irish brigades preferred to use buck and ball, which was a large .69 calibre musket ball with three smaller balls, devastating at close range. The Irish brigades favoured close conditions, though some traded in for .58 calibre Enfield rifles to return fire to the Confederate skirmishers harassing their lines. The fire directed upon the Irish brigade had become so heavy that General Marr gave the order for his troops to lie down. A priest with the Irish brigade, Father Corby, gave last rites to the fallen Irish men. The Confederate skirmishers fell back to their defensive position by the sunken lane. As the Irish brigade reached the crest of the first rise, the Confederates opened fire at a hundred yards from behind their defensive position. The men of Colonel Carnot Posey's Mississippi Confederate brigade collapsed the entire left wing of the 63rd New York. At this stage of the Irish advance, the 63rd was close enough to the Confederate position in the sunken lane to return fire with their infamous buck and ball. One volley was so devastating that the 16th Mississippi routed from battle. The Irish brigades had suffered many casualties in their advance towards the lane, but the casualty count would only get higher. Again, the terrain here would play an important role, as there was a small rise that overlooked the sunken lane. The Confederates were now trapped. The Irish Brigade poured volley after volley of their devastating buck and ball 
into the Confederate position. The 69th New York Volunteers came under severe fire from the Confederates as they soon lost eight colour bearers in quick succession. General Marr's horse was shot from under him and he was carried off the field. The fighting was so severe that Confederate officer John B. Gordon of the 6th Alabama was wounded five times and fell to the ground suffering a facial wound. As he fell toward the ground, his face landed in his hat, and it was only thanks to a Union musket ball that went through the tip of his hat that the blood ran out and ultimately saved him from drowning. Eventually, after sustaining 500 dead and wounded, the Irish brigade had been relieved, and they fell back to their lines in parade ground fashion. They left behind them a lane a thousand yards long, where it is said that you couldn't walk down without touching a body. The battlefield shifted to the Confederate right and onto Burnside's Bridge, where Ambrose Burnside and his Union Ninth Corps of 14,000 men were held up from crossing a 12-metre wide bridge by 400 men of the 2nd and 20th Georgian sharpshooters and 12 cannon hours. The sharpshooters had held their ground just long enough and they fell back to the position of the Piper Orchard, which was just behind the bloody lane. The Union General Richardson's men were forced back as they advanced from the Bloody Lane by Longstreet's cannon battery and Richardson was mortally wounded. The Confederates were reinforced by A.P. Hill's Light Division and the battle came to an end around 5.30pm. Twelve hours of fighting had claimed 23,000 casualties. Because McClellan and his subordinates didn't press their advantage, Lee could match the Union assault almost man for man. Many of the Union soldiers hadn't much combat experience, whereas Lee's men, for the most part, were combat veterans. While skilled and experienced, the Confederacy could not replenish as easily as the Union could. By losing 10,000 men, the South experienced 31% of casualties, whereas the Union suffered 12,000 killed, wounded or missing and lost 15% of their much larger force. Lee had underestimated the speed with which McClellan could muster his force as rather out of character. Once seeing Lee's plans, McClellan acted without haste and marched to meet Lee's men. The battle ended as a tactical victory for the Union as the South had suffered a higher percentage of casualties. Ultimately, the battle was a stalemate as neither force pushed for any major action the following day to cement the victory. Abraham Lincoln used the bloodiest day in US history as a platform to announce his Emancipation Proclamation and in doing so made the Civil War about more than Southern secession and the preservation of the Union. He had made it a war to end slavery. The South had lost their chance to be formally recognised by the main European powers as victory at Antietam would have solidified their nationhood in the eyes of Great Britain and France. The tide of the Civil War was turning. The generals of the day failed to learn from the mistakes made at Antietam and other battles, such as the three-day Battle of Gettysburg the following July, which would claim over 50,000 casualties. Would you like to write an episode for us, just as Sam did for this one? If so, drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org and do go along to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash thehistorynetwork, where you can find out about this podcast and all the other podcasts we produce. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the thehistorynetwork.org podcast, written by Sam de Turberville, read by Nick Barker.